Okay, you can bring, again, you can bring your coffee and tea so that we can start on time. We have a minute before we will actually start. So I hope all the groups, you have all your presentations here. Okay, um, at this point, can I introduce uh, and invite my colleague, Mr. Nyan Vo, who is our MTT Mel specialist who will facilitate the reporting. Nyan? So, thank you everyone for coming back. So, we're going to have a very exciting uh, session ahead of us. Uh, first of all, I would like to explain a little, a little bit what will happen in the next uh, 45 minutes. So we will break the total of uh, one, two, three, and uh, one online section into two groups. So um, we have group one, two, four together, and three, five in uh, big, group, uh, big group A. And we will have three uh, commenters to uh, listen to your presentation of the key finding and discussion, and they will have a conversation with you, uh, more on an open conversational style. They would like to ask for your confirmation of different points, as well as uh, you will give feedback. It's more um, like a bidding, uh -huh. convincing um, other people how how is your plan or your discussion uh, can be moving forward in a more practical ways. So uh, for group one, two, four, can I have a raise of hand? Who belong to group one, two, and four? They left, went to the room. I can't see them, not yet. Uh, group one, two, and four. Oh yeah. Uh, can you please stand up, the home group? Um, Natalia, do you remember the members of the group? <laughs> yeah, if you don't remember what did you do or where you belong to, just open up the back of your name tag. It should write down the number one, two, and four. And then group three and five. Yeah, five group together. Can you stand up? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, uh, I would like to invite the home group to be standing in front of your flip chart, if you might. Do you remember which one is belong to your group? Okay, come, come, come. Today, uh, in this section, you are the speaker. You will be on stage and you will be presenting. The home group. Moral support. Yeah. And one, two, four. Please stand in front of your flip chart as well. Everyone else, can I have a big round of applause so that encouraging our... Okay, one group have two people and another group have 1,000 people. Uh, uh, okay, so... Before we go into have a group presentation, I would like to invite our commenters. We're inviting uh, our special guests who are coming from policy uh, making uh, sector, who are coming from uh, also academia, and who also from um, media, as well as our young uh, early mid career professional as well. So, the, for to commenting the first two group discussion, I would like to invite uh, Ms. Seng who is our uh, media grantee from Summonet. And uh, I would like uh, to also invite Ms. Raon. Uh, she's uh, our special guest. Um, can I have Ms. Raon? Yeah. Hi. Uh, can you let us see uh, and say hello to our uh, family? So uh, Ms. Raon is the director of Wetland Conve uh, Convention Section. Uh, from the Department of Water Resources, Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment, Thailand. Uh, and the last commenter would be 
uh, Dr. Jamie. Hi, Dr. Jamie, can you uh, turn around so everyone know uh, how you look like? Um, Dr. Jamie, he's an AUN uh, fan uh, school of environment and uh, society. He just flying yesterday afternoon to join us today. So please give a big round of applause for our first three commenters who will listen to, listening to two presentations and have a comment as critical question, as critical as possible. And we open for dialogue between uh, the three parties. So, uh, do you have more people? One more, so we have four in total. Uh, so I would like to invite them first. Uh, let's decide who gonna present group one, two, and four. Okay, sure. So you will have approximately five minutes for your presentation, and the floor is yours. For the participant, if you cannot see the flip chart, if you, uh, you can stand, uh, warming up. <laughs> in so that, uh, solidarity with the group of four people here. Um, and uh, if you would like to see more closely to the flip charts, come closer. You don't need to sit on the chair. Feel free to sit, stand on the floor, on the stage, wherever feel comfortable for you. Okay, the floor is yours. Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. Hope you all have a nice afternoon break. Uh, so. For uh, the first question, uh, our group have uh, came up with a lot of ideas, but I would like to uh, summarize it briefly into uh, four main points. Uh, the first point is that uh, uh, we should engage everyone from the start of the project, including uh, community and uh, policy makers and uh, other relevant stakeholders. Uh, the second uh, most uh, important point is uh, for uh, the community to be uh, consistent with local authorities and they can uh, uh, engage in soft advocacy so that they can uh, uh, so that the, the local authorities can get their idea and they can understand and trust them which leads to uh, the third point which is uh, for the community and uh, for researchers as well to invest in a long-term uh, long term investment in building relationship with uh, local authorities and as well as uh, government officials as well so that they could uh, trust us more and they can uh, engage with us more. And the last point is that they can, uh, I mean the researchers can understand the needs of the community so that when they engage in or when they develop the projects, they can like uh, uh, understand the needs of the community as well. As for the current challenges and uh, the actions that are already taken in uh, question two, uh, the current actions that researchers are currently doing includes uh, inclusive participatory research, meaning people can engage in participatory research. And one more thing is that uh, they are exchanging ideas and resources with different groups, like exchanging uh, resources and peer learning so that they can understand each other more. And one more point is that uh, researchers uh, should encourage the community to step forward so that they can engage more with uh, other type of stakeholder. We have also uh, identified the challenges as well when we are working on the projects. The first one is that there is still a lack of representation and participation, especially from marginalized group when they are attending in high level meetings. So in a community meetings, of course, uh, they will join with us, but in high level meetings, for example, let's say a woman, they would not attend high level meetings. They just uh, do not attend even when we invite them. So, but when we separate them and talk within their own group, they would discuss actively as well. And another important point is uh, to be realistic with our project. So being realistic can also achieve a lot because we set the goal to be uh, realistic and we are not trying to be over ambitious. So when we become over ambitious, meaning we set a very high expectations and that could also, uh, one of the disadvantages of our project as well, in case that we could not achieve it, that would show that we would fail the project as well. 
So that will be it from our groups. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next group, you ready? Okay, five minutes. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, on behalf of group number three and number five, we have a um, very inclusive uh, um, teamwork, and we have also a vote of our key points that we want to share with you. For the first question, uh, we have identified the key practice. It's like uh, for the build relations. In our group, we have break out like a two key stakeholder, like individual and organizations. For individuals, we have understand that to build the connections between the on the stakeholder, particularly like um, communities, uh, NGO, and policies to find a uh, middle understanding or common understanding. <laughs> And also to build the trust among the, um, to build the trust throughout the dialogue. So we, if, after we have a good uh, connections between the stakeholder, then we will make a good dialogue to to talk in the same understand. And the highlight that uh, our group have agreed and we vote is to build the network throughout the personal and organization relations. It is really impactful for our practice and sharing from our legions uh, members. And also to understand the power of and dynamic and hierarchy from the stakeholder. And we have add that the capacity building also need in continue uh, supporting the training or um, collaborations. And we have to show the good service to um, both parties, personal and organizations. So for the organizations, we have some common uh, similar uh, point that we also want to build the organization with the more innovation, innovative, and make, have a big impact and be uh, building the networks. And yeah, this is the, f the first question that how to uh, implement and the key practice from our team. And the second question, we act, action to address the barrier for more inclusive policy and practice. In this point, we have divided into two issues. One is the barrier and second is the solutions. For the barriers, we have seen a lot of uh, limitations from, for example, lack of understanding of the inclusive or we have limited time and we have limited resource, particularly human resource and financial resource. And sometimes we have conflict of interest and also we have heresy of organizations policies. And also sometimes we have um, barrier on the changing social norms or behavior of the communities or of the organizations. And then solutions for each one, we have finding like create the awareness is the most important, optimize the practice of our agenda and expand the resource through the networks and to establish the cooperation mechanism and to make the mutual uh, benefits from our actions, both uh, parties of mem uh, stakeholders. That is the brief from our team Maybe our member want to add something. We can uh, have a few more things. Yeah, and one thing I want, to, I want to highlight that our team very inclusive, that we have voting the key points, and we also having a lot of sticky notes that you have seen in, on the papers. Thank you very much. So um, we hear a lot of comments, uh, discussion on engagement with the policy maker and influencer. We uh, heard about trust, we heard about building relation, connection, uh, network. So I think uh, the first question, um, the first person I would like to invite to comment on the two group on this very subject is uh, Ms. Raoul, um, since you are coming relatively from the other side of the table, uh, what would you see 
um, the issue here, or rather the area of engagement with the policymaker networking, promoting qual uh, quality research to policy making process. Uh, thank you. The floor is yours. Cup. Uh, thank you. Uh, actually, uh, I think uh, if you want to engage policy maker, it's important to make them see the benefits that they will receive from your research. Uh, even I come from the policy maker sector, I can tell you that sometimes the policy maker itself, uh, they are afraid of uh, the research. <laughs> Actually, because uh, sometimes uh, when you reveal the result of the research, sometimes it's kind of uh, not good for the project they are doing. Yeah, something like that. So uh, if you want to engage policy makers, it's, it's important for them to see that to see the benefits, like uh, they can work with the community that, that have problem with their project uh, better, or the community will understand their policy better. So it's important uh, to, to show them uh, concrete benefits. And also, uh, the second thing is trust. Actually, I think that sometimes uh, policy make makers, I think that uh, the government sector itself has the issue of trust with the community a lot, uh, especially for uh, the development project, like uh, the water, the water resource development project, or even uh, the conservation project. Uh, actually, uh, the conservation project should not be a problem because uh, it's kind of environmental friendly, but uh, sometimes uh, the government are afraid that like a uh, wetland, if kind of uh, they decide to designate a wetland to be the Ramsar site, then they are afraid that they can develop the land or make the project in the wetland anymore. So this is also the problem. So, uh, but uh, the, com the community, they try to do the research with the university and academic institution to kind of convince the government that, oh, you should designate this because it has a high biodiversity. But uh, maybe uh, only the scientific data uh, are not enough for them. Yes, it's good for environment, but uh, how is it good for uh, the policy maker and for the government? And also it has the trust issue between the community, NGO, academic institution, so it's kind of is something going on like this. And uh, I cannot read what I write. Uh, <laughs> take your time, take your time. We have so, a lot of time. <laughs> we'll uh, so, uh, and uh, I, I think uh, one more thing that I heard from the group is that uh, Sometimes the policy, they do not understand the scientific language. So it's important uh, for, uh, for uh, the academic institution or uh, the uh, professor or from the research side to communicate with them in easy language. But more than easy language is a concrete benefit for the government. Um, and and actually, I think that what, one more thing, I don't know if it's related or not, I think that citizen science is, is also important because uh, it shows that uh, the, the community, it can create a level, level playing field between, uh, between the government, between, uh, between uh, NGO and also the academic in institution. And one more thing that I heard from the presentation is uh, Sometimes uh, the communities or the women, they do not join the meeting. The meeting. This is also the, the issue of the, the government also. When we organize the meeting, uh, many people do not come because uh, they, they need time to do, to, do, uh, to do stuff in their farm or for their agriculture, so their times uh, are very valuable. And so uh, they, they do not trust the government because they see that the government kind of uh, do a uh, stakeholder participation just like uh, for, for token, but not real. So, uh, so, I, so I think that if they will come, you must show them that they have benefits and, and, and also it's 
is kind of a, you need to build trust with the community and also especially with the leader of the community so they can convince uh, the community people to come to the meeting or to, to join your research. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that was a very practical comment. I, uh, I hear that you talking um, many points, good point about benefit, rather share benefit between the stakeholder. Why would I uh, join this effort? Um, what do me or my community or um, my people, to, so to speak, in a relative term, would be benefited from this effort that I'm going to I'm going to put into in the next one year, two year, three years. That is a very uh, real questions. I hear that you uh, you talking about um, in one side that the researcher um, producing scientific data knowledge, but the key taking away is that scientific knowledge is not enough, and um, the and so what would be the gap between scientific data and the policy needs and where is the uh, the local or um, the local knowledge uh, of the community here uh, what is their role what is the um, their capacity to build we hear the examples of uh, the government trying to uh, relocate land wetland for conser uh, conservation but then uh, uh, I, if I'm not mistaken, your point is that the community, uh, at community level, there's not the capacity to make the best use of it or to uh, um, to follow the in, uh, intended objective of uh, what uh, the policy aim to do. So, um, yeah, can we have her, um, a microphone, please? Actually, the government and the, the academic sector, they want to uh, designate the wetland to be the Ramsar site, but the policymaker, the government, they are afraid that if they designate it, it will be the, the, conserve, the, the conserve land, and they cannot develop the project and, and do or do anything with it. So it's just uh, the community and the academ academic side, they want to designate, but the policymaker, they are afraid. <laughs> As, as I said, that sometimes they're afraid of uh, the research, the research result, the policy makers sometimes, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, um, Kun Rayon. So we hear about um, afraid, we hear about trust. Um, so I would like to invite the next um, commenter, Ms. Um, Seng. She's coming from the media and communication background. So in a way, we're expecting communication experts or journalists uh, to answer the question, how are we going to manage to close the gap between policy maker trust and fear and um, resources with our effort from the scientific communities and community uh, people need and demands? Uh, would you uh, not having an excellent or a perfect or a correct answer, but make an attempt for it, please? You've been yeah. staring at me for the last five minutes. I know yeah. I was next. Um, if you don't mind, I would like to stand up. I've been sitting all day. Um, I'm the only one with a black and white picture on the board. Um, I'm a journalist. I'm from Vietnam. I'm um, also a Summonet Media alumni. Um, I'm not an expert, but I have a fair amount of experience in communication. I mean, that's the biggest part of any journalist, honestly. And I've worked in text, I produce podcasts and documentaries, so I can see an issue from different angles. And with the, the same with Mekong, I've written story about the Mekong Delta, I produce podcasts about the Mekong Delta, and documentaries about the Mekong Delta. So hopefully you see me in that capacity. I would like to start um, by saying that I love the role that I'm doing that I've been assigned to do, like listening and sharing what I've learned, because that's what I do all day as a journalist. So I would like to share what has stood out to me and um, what I'd like to see you do more of um, in, in, in your respective work. So I've been jumping around when you guys were in separate groups and taking notes and listening digitally. And what really stood out to me is um, in group two, there was a very key strategy that starting with every project asking why you're doing it. I mean, it sounds so obvious, but sometimes we just forget. 
be practical reasons shouldn't be, well, we were given funding to do it. It should be why the community needs it and why we should go on with this project. Um, what I also heard is to the, the, the role of champions, not just champions in the national agenda or policymaker in the national government, but also local champions, um, the lead farmers of a cooperative, for example, who make sure that they stay fixed it in the community and understand the community and make sure that they can multiply the impact of a certain project, say a research or a, an empowerment project. Um, that um, are led by academic, academics like yourself in the room. What I've also heard from group three and five is how to maximize the values and the talents of individual networks um, and organizations and how do you really deepen that impact. And I think that was so important to look at things from two perspectives instead of saying one is better than the other. Um, in my humble opinion, what I would like to see you do more of is to mirror what um, our facilitators throughout the events that I have done. Is their listening skills. How do you build trust? How do you maintain the sustainable relationship? By listening. Sometimes we just talk over people's head and we don't realize we do so, like I'm doing to you right now. <laughs> um, so listening is obviously key. And it's not just listening with your ears. But I've seen um, or or C or Albert do throughout the day. They practice something I call echoing and mirroring. After they listen to you, they say, what I'm hearing is, if I understand you correctly. I've seen this done in English-speaking context, but not so much in my Vietnamese language. Is it a cultural thing? I don't know. But I would like to do more of that, because I don't think it's limited in languages. The elephant in the room. I have not heard this mentioned, or maybe I, I missed it. Please correct me if I'm wrong. We're talking about the role of policymaker, of academics, of journalists, if I may. But we have not talked about the role of businesses. There is a huge presence of businesses in the Mekong, and there's just like a huge shh when we talk about them. Why? They're funding some of your projects. They're funding a lot of those sand mining projects in the Mekong. Why are we not talking about engaging them in policy making and research capacity? That's some, maybe something we can discuss tomorrow. Um, three, um, this may be a technicality thing, but I see a lot of we should do this, we want to do this, we would like to do this throughout the presentation. Um, it would be great if we can take it beyond uh, the perception of a to-do list. We should do this and that and that with an example. What are the group example or practices that can elevate your points about what should be done? Um, I, forgive me, I forgot the name of the presenter who was presenting um, the findings of this uh, group. He mentioned how to get more women to go to workshop, right? To get all women together. That's a great example. So you, you have an, a reason to why people should listen to your advice. Otherwise, what's the point? Um, and I think at the end of the day is storytelling, is making your message personal and make sure that it leaves something with the people listening to you. So that's my reflection. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Seng. So uh, next, uh, I would like to invite uh, Professor Jamie. I'll give you rather relatively difficult tasks. Uh, we, want, we want to talk about the challenges that the two groups have been presented. I heard that they are talking about participatory approach to meeting, consultation, and policy processes. Uh, they're talking about inviting um, women or people from uh, socially marginalized groups into meeting. Uh, they're talking about their not enough, uh, their lack of understanding. If I'm not mistaken, uh, the understanding uh, of lack here, whether from the policymaker who doesn't understand the scientific data or attempt or intention, or from uh, the community and the scientific um, uh, sectors not understanding the need of the policymaker. And then we're talking about um, the solution as simple as uh, expanding the resources through networking. So we didn't have enough time to explore beyond this, but I would like to ask uh, what would be your, your take on this? Would you like to, to try to answer this? Yeah.
thank you. I currently work as a university researcher, but before I became a boffin, uh, I worked for non-government environmental organisations seeking to influence uh, decision makers. And can I say how exciting it is to be here in a hall full of policy influencers uh, doing exciting and vital work uh, needed to improve equity and sustainability in our societies. I was really taken by the feedback from the groups and I guess I've got three questions about how to address the challenges arising from those groups. The first thing I heard from both groups was everybody's terribly keen to uh, build relationships with everybody, to build trust, uh, to maintain a collaborative engagement. And I totally agree that that's important. But there are trade-offs, aren't there? I mean, that requires an enormous investment of your time and effort. Uh, and uh, you can't do that for all of the issues that you might like to work on. So there's a trade-off between breadth, talking to everybody, and depth, focusing on particular issues and topics where you're trying to uh, achieve change. And so my question for you and your organisations is how do you make that strategic trade-off between depth talking to everybody, getting their agreement and so forth, versus the breadth of issues you seek to, uh, seek to address. The second set of groups uh, raised the very important question of power dynamics. And Ms Sen raised the question of, isn't it government and business and not just government that we should be uh, in engaging? Uh, and that raised the question for me, how many of the groups are really mapping out the power dynamics of the issues that they're working on, identifying who are the key organisations in business and government, who are the individual decision makers who will make a difference, so that those individuals can be engaged constructively uh, to help them see the broader range of options the more equitable and sustainable options that they could uh, choose among. How strategically is that mapped out? And then the third question uh, I heard, uh, I was really, um, really noted Dr Netra's uh, comment earlier about how many of the issues we deal with are contested. Uh, how many government decision makers are very risk averse. And Director Prayon uh, raised the very same question. How do we constructively work on issues that are contested when government decision makers are very risk averse? Are there ways that we can undertake our work in a no surprises manner that uh, reassures those government agencies, those decision makers, uh, that we're working in the public interest, in their interests, that we're there to help them, that we will use information that they trust and regard as reliable so that they feel some ownership of the results. A lot of my work is undertaking research that Australian government agencies find very confronting. And uh, one of the ways we try and undertake that so that our research findings are accepted is to meet with them when we're starting the research, to ask them what is the information that they would regard as reliable? What are the matters that we should consider in undertaking the research? We often take our draft research and show it to them and invite them to correct any errors that we have made. Uh, as a way of um, reducing the risk uh, that they see and ensuring that there are no surprises. And I'm wondering, uh, in the context in which each of you are working, are there ways in which you can research the hard issues, provide new options, uh, but uh, do it in a way that our government friends uh, feel will help them. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Jimmy. So um, we asked a member of the two group if you have any reflection, rather to uh, either to specific speaker or to the whole commentation section. Uh, you can easily raise your hand. So I'm asking the whole audience if you have any feedback, if, if you have any reflection of what you have been hearing for the entire uh, section here. A lot of starings and uh, not many hand raising. Okay, yeah, thank you for volunteering. I'm sweating here. Okay, thank you. But uh, my question is more or less like the questions that we were given are so long. I mean, like the question is so long, we could not even actually debunk the questions actually in the first place. So we'll try to read those questions. So we'll need to identify the keywords and what does the keyword mean to different people. And then we can settle down like how, what, how we can answer the questions. Sometimes the questions are given actually, it actually addresses like the first uh, question was saying, how to simplify the questions to make it more accessible to people, the audience. You have not considered the audience here actually when you prepare the questions. So probably that's a recommendation for you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for criticism. We're always open for that. Uh, Dr. Huan, um, would you like to make a comment? Yep. Can we have a microphone for him? Thank you. Uh, by this opportunity, in fact, have a suggestion to Donna. Yeah. Uh, when we have uh, this uh, project, usually we have a donor and we have a donor driven. And the donor usually uh, put in like a request us to apply uh, when we prepare proposal to apply donor concept and donor methodology. For example, USC. We have to apply to the Australian GSC, and we apply the methodology analysis GSC, Australian concept, it described. But then in Mekong, we have the Mekong GSC differently with the GSC from Australia. The same like uh, we have a Mekong English, and it is different with the Australian English. So I think. Uh, in this case, maybe we have a training about Gracie, but we have to compare the Gracie Australian and the Gracie of Mekong and see how different. And when we have uh, the assessment of the program, we have to consider these uh, differences. And don't try to assessment by compare how the project or the program achieve uh, the asset criteria of GSE or methodology in Australia and do assess the project or the program. Because uh, we have to adapt the concept and the methodology to fit with the culture, the social condition, the environment, and the economic current development state of the Mekong country. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Han. Um, would our commenters or the group members like to uh, attempt to make a calm feedback on the Jesse? So the uh, issue here, Dr. Han raised that there's a certain differences between uh, the Jesse framework or um, um, terminologies from um, Australia or, or the international organization or donors, and there's a certain conception or understand it, understanding of what it means uh, social inclusion, what it means gender equality, what it means you know, disability inclusion. Um, Dr. Leoni, I'm happy you raised your hand. Here. Thank you. I just wanted to share what our group came to, which is we actually started this discussion by saying our first thing is to decolonize JEDSI. 
So that's the first step we need to do in any of answering any of these questions. Um, and we talked about that in making it contextually specific, but also that many of these terms and ideas um, or the issues are actually used already and are known already. But it's about ensuring that we don't just put in or parachute in another term um, and that we also make it contextually relevant uh, for the countries that we're working in. So that was our first step before we got to answering any of the questions. Thank you. Anyone want to make a comment? Ah, Dr. Surijan. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, the, the same question we also facing in our day-to-day -day work. Uh, it's not only this network. I think there are a few things perhaps we need to keep in mind. First, uh, when we see the opportunity where the project could value adding to our work, so we see the concept and understanding behind. Uh, first, if it gives value, that's how you start thinking about how you can really tap on resources and, and funds. No? So that's number one. Number two, I think this more or less rest, uh, uh, referring to the question to Dr. P. Piamon in the morning, you know, when you have international concept, uh, do we sort of adapt to the regional local context or not? And whether we dilute the concept? I would say, yes, we need to adapt because why? Contexts are different. It's about coexisting with the norms, local knowledge and wisdom also make the translation different. Here, this is the beauty. Most of the donor agencies do not push their agenda directly, take it as given, but they would like to see that their, uh, some sort of a policy uh, objective is incorporated. If you are able to explain in what manner this policy objective is incorporated and addressed, most donor and development partners would welcome. They even feel better that we, if we show how incorporation is made. So third is about justifying, explaining, and showing equivalence. This is oftentimes undermined, and people just easily take it as given. This is where the problem starts. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Surijan. Uh, one more question on, uh, um, one more comment on the Jesse um, before we moving on to the next one. We have a few uh, grants that focusing on uh, Jesse under MTC program, I would like to see our um, research team, um, this research team to responding. How did you incorporate, adapt, dilute the Jesse framework that um, take into consideration to your uh, local context? Yes, Dr. Tim Noy. Yeah. Can you introduce yourself and your organization? Yes, Thank yes. you. Good, good afternoon. Thank you, Ngan, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Tim Noy Salisai. I'm from Laos. I'm from Supanavong University. So uh, I'm here with our team researcher with a grantee, uh, Rapid Response, MTT. So that's such a nice event for me. And it, it, was, it is my first time as well. So in terms of JRC and in the in our, let me brief some what we have done and what we have planned before about our JSC work. Like uh, in our project scope, we have uh, both in academic, uh, in terms of uh, conservation and also engagement of JSC uh, for enhancing physically reliance, reliance in Laopedia. So in this term, we included JSC in all terms. We start with the team member. Like in our team member, also we consider both men and women. And for JSC in the community level, also we respect a lot and try to listen from them, the community, what the idea, what they are thinking about at such a work. So that we, we include them and uh, respect their idea and let's planning together and let's make a, a decision making together. And then the output of the project also, we will make some impact at, uh, as we call the most significant change after uh, some certain terms of implementation. And we all agreed that uh, in our project, uh, research project, and not only just a 
one first term project. So we also do hope that um, the project uh, based, uh, co sorry, community based uh, learning can make new chains for themselves, also for us to understand and to make mutual understanding and so on. And then we can make some new chains and some impact, even it is not that big impact to the community and also to the policy maker. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think before moving on, I would like to invite Karen, uh, who, who's the MTT program Jesse team. Uh, she's the one of the uh, co-writers uh, of our MTT Jesse strategies. We're talking about we will never finalize as a fixed document for Jesse strategies. It's always a continuous learning process for us. Um, can you very briefly uh, walk us through how did we applying or taking um, the Jesse framework and make it more localized context? Please go ahead. Thank Great. you. Thank you, Nian. Um, I first of all want to acknowledge uh, all of the projects that are being able to incorporate GEDC. I know that it's been a bit challenging to take that GEDC lens and to do it, but there has been some tremendous progress just over the last few months. Each and every project has a GEDC focal point uh, who is in direct coordination with MTT uh, Secretariat as well as myself to help support that process. It's Look, it's not like a tick the box exercise where you do a bunch of things and then it's been completed. It's a process and it's a lens and it's almost taking a project and instead of looking at it just straight on, you're, you're twisting it around and you're turning it upside down and you're asking different questions and you're exploring it from, from a different perspective, really. That's what we're asking you to do. So we have, yes, we do have a GEDC strategy for whole of program and we have developed a guidance note to support projects in a very, hopefully not burdensome way to think about, well, how do I want to approach this project and integrate um, GEDSI through developing partnerships with organizations who maybe I hadn't been in touch with before? And how do I look at the project cycle of the research that I'm doing or the implementation and think, well, where does GEDSI come in at each of these points in the project? So I, more than anything else, want to applaud the projects who are here for the work that they're doing and for their willingness to engage with JETSI. I think there's a lot of learnings already and we will be discussing those in a more focused way on Thursday. So looking forward to continuing this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. And with that, uh, we would like to conclude the first um, presentation of the two group. Thank you, uh, Ms. Rowan, for your very um, critical but practical uh, comment from the policy making uh, sector. I would like to thank doc Dr. Jamie as well uh, for your comment and as well, and also Ms. Seng Wing, are you still here? Still in black and white like in the profile photo. Thank you very much from, from your communication experience as well. So I would like to quickly move on to the next and the last three group. Um, you will see two flip charts and one invisible one because they are online we like to include people, regardless of you are on site with us, and for many reasons, you cannot and still participate online. Um, maybe I would like to invite uh, Kun Poripat, if we have anyone presenting the online uh, group to be on the stage as well. And uh, the other two group, um, we have group six and eight. Would you like to show a raise of hand? Okay. Can we have a big round of applause for them? And group seven and nine, where are you? Dr. Leonie raising two hands. <laughs> Dr. Malay. Okay, we will come to you first and now let the member um, jog their memory and remember uh, where they're from. So Dr. Sin, would you represent your group? Uh, okay, please go ahead. I'm very pleased to present some of the results that uh, come up from the two group, and uh, we set up the kind of two level of uh, discussion. Uh, the first one is at the national and regional level. That is quite important, but given the limited of timing, we cannot discuss it more in, in detail. So 
And then the second level is at the local and community level. That's why we have uh, enough time to discuss in depth. So at the first level, at national and regional uh, level, we think that uh, each individual country have to be try to align uh, our strategy to what uh, four uh, selected uh, SDG uh, goal. And uh, in this way, uh, we think that uh, we can uh, collectively in, at the regional level to address those transboundary issue. And this is something that uh, we like to do, but, but uh, we cannot do it uh, at the, at the, at the in-depth. Uh, but uh, we have uh, more uh, chance to look at the low, lower level, at the local and the community level. Here we discuss something uh, very important that uh, we need to spend our effort to build the trust, very important things, and also to ensure that uh, we have, uh, our communication is transparent. So uh, secondly, uh, we have to engage with the diverse stakeholders in, the, in the, the very beginning. Next is to understand the barrier and to prioritize your action to deal with this priority, uh, with this barrier. Next is to organize the policy dialogue with uh, policy maker, private sector, affected uh, community. And in this regard, we think that most of the challenges for us is to engage business sector. And uh, one of our, our the strategic uh, entry point, how to enter, how to engage the business is to identify who, which kind of type of business uh, sector we would like to engage. And we, we, we recommend that uh, to begin with the, uh, we call the, the private uh, sector, but with the women-led business. We, th we, th we, seen, we, we think that the, the business uh, women lead uh, is mostly have a more uh, soft uh, mindset and to, to, uh, is, is receptive to uh, different uh, things and then also try to, she, she can, uh, de uh, how to say, it, uh, 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 the, have some certain uh, diffusion later on when we get the, the involvement of our business sector. So, so uh, engaging with, uh, with the, the, the women lead uh, uh, business uh, is, is something that we think this is our strategic uh, intervention. So this is something that uh, we highlight, that's what we uh, come up from the two group. If there's something uh, I'm missing, so please uh, add it to what I already discussed. If you think that it's already uh, we represent our uh, opinion uh, and discuss, and then we are listening to the audience to uh, answer any of your comment or question. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Sin. Uh, feel free to remain on stage or uh, coming back to the seat. Um, so the next group, uh, seven and nine. Dr. Loney, have you seen your member? Okay, Dr. Malay. Okay, so maybe after our group, maybe we'll be coming to question and answer. Okay, so we started our discussions with two groups, and thank you our group members to have uh, those discussions. Uh, we put it together, and we can see a few seats look like rich picture. So let us discuss those rich picture. Uh, so we started uh, from uh, decolonized ZC, where we speak about um, how we can um, integrate those JST, uh, JTC, uh, we, we talked about uh, opportunities. Means uh, if we are thinking for integrating those JST, then what kind of opportunities we can uh, think about. And then we, we discussed um, uh, some of the local context. And then we also talked about some of the knowledge gaps. Then we discussed about some of the participatory approaches. And then we move to uh, some of the practices. How can we move ahead? So our team member provided that, uh, first of all, we need to understand strong evidence. Um, there are a lot of projects running in. And all projects thinking about different, different approaches. 
So how all approaches we are clubbing together to generate a strong evidence, how JETC integration can be a uh, co-benefit to the, um, particularly for policymakers or maybe to other stakeholders, how we can approach them to motivations. Maybe, maybe we can, uh, we discussed about uh, some of the uh, motivations, means if we can try to uh, maybe co-benefit if we can prioritize some co-benefits, maybe that can accelerate some of the good priorities with, with all stakeholders. Then we discussed about some of the um, opportunities. Uh, because uh, sometimes we can feel that there are uh, gaps. So can we make those gaps to, towards opportunities? Uh, maybe need some of the um, dialogue, maybe need some of the uh, discussions with local communities, with, with their knowledges. Maybe if we can create those opportunities, maybe we can accelerate and motivate those of the people to integrate. And then we discussed about some of the um, uh, lobby. Definitely that's needed. Even there are a lot of discussions in, in uh, last two days that lobby is definitely needed because that's depend on, uh, there are multiple things, and which things actually going ahead, that's depend on lobbyists. So but there are a lot of discussions, maybe formal, informal, uh, our eminent uh, professors also mentioned, maybe in, in some other way we can find out how to make uh, those lobby to make it in, in finer way. And then also we discussed about some of the bottom-up approaches. Maybe community can provide us real guidance to uh, making those evidences to moving towards policy. So we also discuss about those bottom-up approaches, but still, again, we debate not only bottom-up, somehow we can th think about that bottom-up, maybe uh, scale is very small, but whenever uh, anyone thinking from top, how, how that scale up can be for broader people's benefit. So we were discussed and debates on how, how both way we can think about and we discussed some of the real experiences from our visit to local government, then whenever we are talking about community and bottom-up approaches, then uh, government have real approaches that somehow those, those kind of thing, whatever coming from community, that's not sometimes realistic. So how, to, how we are validating those experiences into making, making realistic solutions, that's also have to be very synergic uh, in discussions. And then also we discussed about some of the good practices as a, a build trust. How trust, even from our project, um, we also observed that uh, whenever we are going to um, communicate with, with communities, what is their struggles, risk, then we are feeling that our oh, community sometimes scared with, with whenever unknown people coming to us, those things. So can we build such a kind of trust with getting appropriate kind of information or maybe through those trust, maybe maybe informally or maybe formally, we can collect some of the realistic information to be implemented. And then, if we are collecting those information, say, then then how transparently we are analyzing appropriately to make it trust with government. Whenever we are analyzing those data and all, uh, are we realistically um, completely generating some appropriate knowledges, or is there any any gap between? Uh, generating those knowledges. So that trust also have to build with all the stakeholders, not only community to um, maybe academicians, academicians to policymakers to be uh, translated in appropriate way, in appropriate manner. So we discussed that and then also uh, our other colleagues also mentioned that uh, we, can, we can think about goal-oriented approaches. We discussed about some model-specific outputs and uh, community approaches. Then also we discussed about some of the real story, because real story somehow is coming with few people, few community. So if we are thinking for bigger policy, that not be possible in a, in a broader scale, but somehow if, it through, if local government can prioritize that through some of the storytelling, or maybe that real picture maybe can be translated into better, better um, adaptation strategy or policies. Okay, then I think we discussed a lot about our practices. Maybe that's all. Yeah, if our colleague uh, want to add some more few things, maybe we can uh, come into later on those sections. Okay, let me come to discuss on barriers and how to uh, we can actually appeal to maybe um, translate into solutions. So we discussed that um, uh, there are a lot of barriers in terms of uh, 
uh, whatever discussion we had there that that languages, local culture, local kind of uh, knowledge is, is very different in different countries, in different regions, in different, um, maybe we can say, communities. So how those kind of learning can be appropriate and systematic that's needed to generate appropriately. Then also we discussed about definitely we are starting now to implement those kind of policy and context. So if we are in initial phase, so then, then how those evidence continuously we are gathering to making into uh, some of the local policy, then regional, then national, maybe we can prioritize as far as for uh, scaling up into a uh, broader level. Then also we discussed about that lack of JTC knowledge is not only, uh, definitely we are debating a lot, but I feel that uh, those gaps uh, definitely will be in community because they are somehow, uh, there are participants from those community or maybe local leader and all, but still we need more participation from those community to um, active learning those, those practices and they can understand appropriately. They can uh, somehow whenever we are querying or maybe we are interviewing or maybe through our questionnaire we are trying to understand, we feel there are still gap because in that questionnaire maybe within few minutes we are capturing all the evidences. So how those evidences can be in broader view uh, that if they understand, maybe they can provide more broader uh, knowledge to us. And then we discussed about um, uh, lack of policy makers. Definitely uh, they also need to learn through different kind of co-production approaches or maybe, maybe with realistic understanding they can uh, maybe understand more motivate towards CHC and maybe that can help to really implement uh, those strategies. So we, we think about some of the uh, action uh, so definitely that's, uh, we thought, talk about firstly on co-benefits. If everybody understand, we are talking about a lot, but uh, whenever there are benefits, some of people coming and motivating them easily to um, uh, really implement in, in solutions. So definitely needed to think about us even that co-production, uh, definitely co-benefits. And then communication gap also we try to find out that, that maybe maybe within among all stakeholders there are a lot of communication gap. If we can do it with local language, with, with locally understandable um, wordings, or maybe uh, clear messages from any media, maybe that can enhance about to understand uh, among all the uh, collaborators. Dr. Malay, please wrap up. Uh, then we discussed about knowledge cooperation and also maybe enhancing knowledge among all the stakeholders. That's all. I think I already explained all. Maybe if our colleague or uh, our team member would like to add anything, uh, open floor for them. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Malay. Um, I would like to invite Kun Boripat to share. He has been moderating our online participants and especially during the breakout work cafe group. Please. Yeah. Hello. Okay. Hello again, everyone. My name is Boripat. I'd also like to uh, give a shout out to my co-facilitators for the online. Um, there was also Kun Klomjit, uh, Boki, and also Agus as well. So the way our uh, online group kind of worked through this was that we, instead of separating into uh, different groups, we actually, as in one group, uh, worked together through all the questions. So in that way, we were extra inclusive. Uh, so some, maybe some key like observations is that I, from our discussions, it was quite a lively discussion. And I was also really, uh, it was also really nice to see that a lot of the discussions were quite practical instead of just academic or theory. So on the first question on uh, inclusive communication strategies, uh, the recommendations including, for example, when presenting data, to keep it simple, use pictures, graphs, uh, and keep the language simple. Translate info into local languages, and again, keep it simple. Use audio if that's a more appropriate uh, platform or mode. They also suggested some novel ideas such as role playing, board games, scenarios, and telling stories. Some additional considerations included move away from using traditional tools to create communication products. Consider free and new platforms to create them, such as ChatGBT, Canva, and other tools. And most importantly, make sure that your communication products are accessible to your stakeholders. 
For the second question on building strong relationships with policy stakeholders, there was recommendations around building or supporting a platform that is a safe space where stakeholders can speak freely. Build trust with stakeholders, have consistent engagement with them, don't just talk to them at the beginning and then at the end of the project. Know the right people to talk to, have your, uh, know your policy stakeholders, know them as a person, but don't come across as if you want something from them. It's also really important, uh, and this was highlighted, to know the right time to talk to them as well. For example, don't talk to them during an important national holiday week, or don't talk to them over lunches, because in some cultures, that may be considered bad form. On the third question of the importance, uh, important actions to address barriers, it was uh, underlined that uh, JETSI should be integrated early, stakeholders should be involved in the early stages, they, we should uh, customize interventions, put in the right solutions, not what you think, but what the stakeholders need. And they also give an example as well. One of the, uh, one of the representatives from a PAO said that they were putting in separate toilets for people with disabilities. And as another point, as I think has already been mentioned, is that it's important to explain the benefits to policy stakeholders, but also underlining it when you're explaining it, keep it simple. And lastly, uh, share, share information, provide capacity building, and also raise awareness. And because our team was very uh, efficient, we also had a bonus question. And the question was, uh, what is your vision for JETSI in the future for the Mekong region? And the team members gave both practical and also aspirational uh, kind of visions. From the practical sense, they wanted to see seats for people with disabilities in public transport, because that is not the case in all Mekong countries. They also wanted to see more platforms and spaces for women and marginalized groups where they can share freely. A more aspirational vision uh, was that the, everyone needs our address. And as one last bonus bonus suggestion, they suggested to say, they said that we should take stock of lessons learned from previous work and implement them when moving forward. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Kumbori Pat. So um, I just tried to sum up uh, all of the um, group discussion. Dr. Sin group mentioned about uh, different level, um, regional, national. Uh, we, uh, we talk about Jesse, and we also uh, briefly touched on the SDG goals, another terminology uh, that we use in our research, in our engagement and policy influencing. We're talking about community and local and uh, emphasize very important to build trust and to engage as diverse stakeholder groups as possible, and a big emphasize on uh, how to engage private sector, especially, uh, and I quote from uh, women-less uh, businesses to into uh, relevant uh, project and effort. And then we move on to uh, Dr. Malay. Uh, we also talk about um, a lot of terminology of engagement, how to um, provide or fill in the knowledge gap for policy making and influencing, talking about opportunity to engage in, and, influ uh, and advocate for Jesse in policy, um, how to um, improve or invest it in long-term trusts. I would understand it as how to uh, engage and improve the cooperation between uh, the research group and the policymaker beyond the project cycle, beyond the implementation cycle. Uh, talking about uh, co uh, cooperation of knowledge, it's a very similar term to what we have been discussing as knowledge code production. We can explore it more. And last but not least, from our online participants, uh, we uh, had a discussion on uh, free and new platform, uh, emphasize on free, how to, um, how to provide a free space for people of different uh, background and stakeholder, such as socially marginalized group, women with disability, um, uh, LGBTQs, uh, uh, et cetera. We're talking about um, how to not just engage the policy maker at the beginning at the, and at the end, but I leave the blank here uh, for everyone of us to reflect and fill in. And, um, Last but not least, we're talking about what is the right time to influence policy? Do you understand the policy uh, cycle and where is the entry point and um, explaining the benefits? 
of the project or the attempt to the policy making. And uh, we also have our commenter. Uh, we are running uh, out of time, so I would like to ask for your kind understanding and make it quick. So each uh, commenter would have two minutes to comment on two, uh, into three groups. This is a very challenging um, request, but please bear with us. So the first one, I would like to invite um, a commenter. She's a policy maker. She also from a Jesse organization, Dr. Nim Pasue, the general director of the Department of Women Development under the Laos Women Union. Dr. Nim Pasue, you ready? Yeah. Uh, two minutes, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. So first of all, I would like to uh, thank all of you that to trust me to do a really short uh, comments on your speaking or sharing the best practices. Uh, first, uh, before we move to my comments, actually I have two minutes only. Please ask yourself, licious policy or policy licious is the same meaning for you? Licious policy and policy licious is the same meaning to you? Who is a, uh, who feel is different? Please raise your hand. Yes, upper, please. Yeah. Who feel is the same? Ah, no answer. So that's why it's your, your, in your body you, uh, you don't have anything clear. The same like uh, inclusive policy. Actually, when we talk about the leashes, there are a very, very, uh, how to say, that is uh, difficult for us. First of all, we should look uh, on the team first. What uh, specifically that we need to find it out in our region? Clear yourself. Leashes can make the recommendation to on policy makers. That one can be divided into three areas that uh, you recognize the most important things for the policy maker. Let them trust us first. And second thing is for the community and for the local authority. So how to encourage them to participate in our papers, in our leases. This is what we call accountability. It's a, I, I, hear, I heard, have heard that this group and that group totally differently the way of thinking. And uh, please note that we are the, in the Mekong region. We should have the same view in doing that. In the leases, there are 10 things that you, 10 things that you should do. I do agree with the uh, doctor, Dr. Jasmine, just uh, how to influence the people. First one, when you want to do it, and how you want to do it, and who you want to do it. It present the people. This is, is not political papers. It's not political lens. And when you are doing the research, you should stick on time. Time is really important and put a very spe uh, specific agenda. You should answer yourself. And the next one is, I do think it's really important for you as well in terms of focus on your idea. Do you agree with me? When do you when do you uh, uh, when do you plan to do the leases? You should focus on your idea and uh, how to do a really good example on doing that. Try to answer yourself that one. And next is how to take time and stick on that. And of course, we do have the opportunity to do the uh, evaluations and uh, monitoring. So and later on, we can distribute to on other. Uh, how to say the access to the resources to share the best experiences into other agency. Because in the leases, there are two leases. I don't know, because when I, I do have two masters and one PhD. I will have one more PhD or law. Because I prepare myself, when I retiring, I can be the lawyers. So leases, there are two leases. One is action leases. And another one is academic leases. So you answer yourself what exactly we want to do. Because excellent leases and leases academic art is differently from each other. Do you agree with me? Therefore, in your perspective, please uh, make it very really concrete the way of thinking and mapping clearly and doing this alternatively. 
I do agree on your idea because we have opportunity to sharing our best experiences that you are facing and you are the member of the network. Uh, we are doing different way because five countries sitting here is uh, we also have a uh, different perspectives on doing how to move forward in our. And the last point, I would like you very much to think about three main areas. This morning, the guy uh, from the professor from uh, Summonet members that she, he mentioned it about it. We should think about the merchandising group. Some of us already think about that. And the second one is about the gender lens. So gender perspective and because the women are horn half of the sky. If you don't have the women in all areas, mean that you are development success only 50%. I don't know, do you agree or not, but it's up to you, no? And the last point is uh, talking about the children, merchandising group and next generation. In one component of the summer sets, we talk about the youth and generation, but today, when we talk about six group talking about this, nobody else talking about our children and how to build a really good uh, future for them and how to encourage them to share their voice and how to protect them and etc. And thank you very much. Maybe I have more than two minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Nimbaswe. Um, next, I would like to um, invite somebody from the other side of the, um, of the story, um, a rather young faces, uh, very, one of the very new fellow from MTT program, Ms. Uh, Vung Kha Tu. Um, she's uh, from University of Kanta. Uh, would you like to make a comments on the presentation? Yeah, thank you very much. So hello everyone. I'm a little bit nervous because I'm very rest here in a consultation. So I think I need to learn a lot from everyone here. So um, I just want to share the viewpoint of a youth from the Mekong Delta of Vietnam um, in the process of like uh, engagement in the policy making process in Vietnam. Um, so I understand from the reverse presentation, there are two main barriers in engagement of GST policy. Um, the first barrier is from the lacking collaboration between stakeholders. And second one is the lacking of the awareness about GST from the communities. Um, so the solution uh, for these issues is active listening and community um, the community training. It is really uh, important to uh, decolonize the Jesse, uh, my group have mentioned. But I uh, see there are gap, like um, one key thing is that the policy, the political, the political framework um, in Asian countries is um, it's totally different. So when you discuss about the action plan, you need to be more specific. For example, the context in Vietnam is totally different from Cambodia, something like that. So when we discuss some uh, <laughs> like global topic like this, you need to be more specific uh, to, like, to make it more realistic solution for the problem. So it my view point. Um, my viewpoint from the from my experience working with the local community in the Mekong Delta. Yeah. So uh, mm, yeah, that's all for my like reflection and like sharing about my experience uh, to engage the youth voice and the youth engagement in policy making process. Thank you very much, too. So now we coming back. Uh, I would like to invite uh, another policymaker, and this time he's coming from Cambodia uh, government, um, Mr. Rapo Ray Chan. He's uh, from the Ministry of Public Works and Transportation, Cambodia. Are you with us here this afternoon? Oh, yeah. Please, go ahead. Please give him a big round of applause, everyone. Yes. Good. Uh, 
Good evening, everyone. Are you hungry? Yes. Yeah. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Not not evening good yet. Good evening. Yeah, yeah. The lights still on. <laughs> okay. Just uh, today I come with a, a short reflection. So I would like to uh, reflect to the group number six first. Then uh, they talk about the uh, uh, sub-national level and national level policy uh, making. That this is uh, the question that I want to ask in the morning from the expertise that uh, from the researcher, which way it means that uh, so do they need to incorporate with national level policy maker or sub-national level policy maker? If we talk about the sub-national level policy maker, it may be easy because very small scale. Yes, small scale. We can organize the framework, institutional framework, district, provincial framework, district framework, commune framework. It is okay. But uh, from policy making, so however you work with subnational level, you need to get approval with national level as well. Because subnational level, it is implementer, not developer. Yes. This is uh, from my reflection on, on, uh, on uh, group six. And another thing, maybe a uh, reflection to the online group, uh, talking about the uh, uh, we're talking about the, uh, yes, done pushing the policy maker to agree with what you have done. <laughs> yes, because as you know that uh, we are in the government, so the process to get the signature from minister is not easy. But yes, it's not easy. Maybe, sometimes maybe take three months, six, six months, and sometimes more than one year. So, so it means that when you start doing your research, please incorporate the policymaker in the initial stage. Yes. It's not that uh, you finish your research and you call me to join the workshop and uh, push me to agree from what you have done. Cannot be. Yes. This is more ref reflection. From the group number seven, uh, yes, I joined this group as well. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, from this reflection, I um, I interest in the uh, decolonized Gen Gen C meaning. Yes, from uh, from my experience, before uh, we make the policy, I need to understand the definition or terminology of the work first, because terminology. Gen C terminology may be uh, in Cambodia different from Thailand. Thailand may be different from Laos. Laos may be different from another country as well. Because we have to fit terminology to fit with the, our society context. Yes. So I think that from this uh, reflection, so uh, the barrier, the, the, the big, uh, the main barrier to uh, get the research uh, to uh, incorporate the research with uh, policy, I think that we need to clarify the definition of Gen C first and put the, that definition in the law regulation. And after that, we need to frame which or uh, what, which ministry that they are working reg regarding to the Gen C. Yes. And after that, look back to your research topic which sector that you are working to, and which ministry that aligns with, your, uh, with uh, your topic. And you can go through to contact with them, internally contact or officially contact. It is based on your skill, yes. But normally, we, we, need, we need to make them the trust first. You cannot go and knock the door and say that I have a good idea. I want to share you a good idea and you have to do following to my idea cannot. So you have to make a communication, make the conversation with them, make them the trust. Trust is mean that, uh, the trust in the policy is mean that uh, you give benefit, your output give benefit to society and 
provide the effect, positive effect to the government. Following to the, our government strategy, international strategy, yes, it is all for me. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rapore, um, for your comments and last commenter, but not least. He's from an intergovernmental organization, uh, consists of six Mekong countries, China, Laos, Vietnam, Cambodia, and Thailand. Uh, Mr. Um, uh, Suri Jans, our very close partner in uh, MTT program. The floor is yours. What is your take, your perspective from the intergovernmental um, government um, organization? Yeah, you, you, you must be tired. I think you, you try to, to rush things. Uh, I try to focus on something that has not been mentioned or emphasized uh, a lot. No? I have four, four quick points. We're talking about trust building no? uh, in the policy influencing processes. But I think from my personal experience, uh, there is also some prerequisite. And this is what I refer to it as psychology and mindset in influencing policy. Uh, many of uh, uh, policy influencing experience I have witnessed. Many cases come with good intention but turn out to be confrontation. And I think to a large part of it is about the mindset and constructive engagement. Uh, one of the, uh, some sort of explanation I always have is that when we have issue in the middle and uh, the researcher is on one side, government on the other side, this is how we see it, this is how you see it, why don't you think this way and that way? This kind of mindset and psychology will not end up a very good result. What should be is that we put the problem in front of us, we are on the same side and we try to help to find a, a pathway where issue is addressed. No? So this is the first point. Second point, I would like to echo the, the facilitator about importance. If you want to influence policy, you need to understand how the policy black box is working. No? To understand policy interest, to understand uh, uh, policy implementation context, because many cases it's not a policy that has problem, it's about translating policy into implementation and what drive policy impacts. If you understand that this is how you started to design the research package message and influence how policy is set so as to deliver the benefit or result they want. That's number two. Number three, we have discussed a lot about local policy and national policy, but we've, we, dis we discuss about water, energy, and climate. And these three issues, if you agree, would agree with me, these are issues where no single country can address. We haven't, done, uh, we haven't discussed so much about what is the policy that is developed at the sub-regional level and how that regional, sub-regional policy uh, is formulated and how this could serve the basis to really discuss about coordinated action where we not, do not need to take the same action but we need to coordinate this action so as to address these issues of transboundary and cross-border uh, nature. I would like to end by one last point about uh, Kesi, no? my, my personal belief is that the policy is there. Our political master has been including this in statement. If you check, you know, it's there. The real issue is not about the policy. It's about operationalizing policy. And if one thing we can learn from, I would like to give an example of Greater Mekong Subregion Program. You know? They discuss about gender for years and years. The issue is that policy keep hitting the same statement, but we didn't see much result. One thing we have learned from it is about operationalizing policy. And if those who have read GMS gender strategy, you will find that this strategy is not about advocating important, it's about identifying entry point where gender could reinforce the policy implementation and ensuring impacts. So what I would like to emphasize is that sometimes it's not about policy itself, it's about operationalizing policy. And this is part of how research could contribute to making policy to work on the ground. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Um, so I just want to summarize um, the second half of the section before we moving on. So Dr. Nimbus, we're talking about different focuses, how to trust. We hear a lot of um, this word uh, in this afternoon section. We're talking about um, sharing the view. We also heard about research, not a policy paper. Uh, there's a differences between action research and academic research. There's um, how do we have five countries moving forward together. And we have the echo from uh, the last speaker, which is Dr. Suri Chan, talking about regional policy um, as well. We, uh, she talked about three main areas that we can uh, tap on. Um, it's a gender lens. We uh, have, she has mentioned about children is the future of the, uh, children is the future of the region. And, um, and then two, talking from her young professional um, perspective on um, her understanding of Vietnamese policy process as a lack of collaboration for policy influencing, the lack of Jesse awareness at um, basically uh, different levels and uh, how community uh, scanning should be the, uh, the first step before uh, implementing or adapting any uh, framework into the work. Uh, and then we move on to doc, um, Mr. Rapore. He's talking on um, the easier way to approach a smaller scale as a local uh, subnational uh, policy framework. Um, we shouldn't be uh, pushing too hard. There is, you know, behind the scene of how policy framing formulating take time to get approval, take time to get um, to get past the uh, national level and um, decolonizing Jesse's is still uh, on the subject. And the last speaker, uh, Dr. Surijan, he's talking about how we should think more carefully and again about uh, um, the terms, you know, you, uh, us, we versus them, they, uh, between the academia, the local communities, uh, media, and the policy maker. Uh, he talked more about on the policy like flex box. Do we understand what we are uh, trying to uh, inf uh, influence? What try policy impact? Uh, we tend to uh, forgot about the cross country, the regional uh, level of policy influence, but tend to focus on more local and national levels. Um, so this is the space that our uh, program can explore more and identify. Uh, last but not least, to identify the uh, entry point for gender is also um, making sense. And I would like to wrap up this section by inviting our very last uh, speaker. He's our uh, friend and a supporter of the Mekong region for a very long time, I believe. Uh, I would like to invite Dr. John Dose, uh, who uh, will give us more of a general critical reflection on the section. Thank you. There's a uh, saying called the graveyard shift. Does anyone know what that is? The graveyard shift. Andrew, my countryman, what is the graveyard shift? Yeah, who would nominate themselves to be speaker number 12 in a session? Okay, no one. Now, I'll be really quick. I've just sort of, uh, we were gonna do something else when I thought there was more time, but we're gonna do something else now at all. Um, okay, who are researchers? That, that's also a question. Well, you know, your research is now. For how long are you a researcher? You know, um, what is your career plan? We've just heard from Madame, you know, a, a, a snippet of a career plan. Most of you won't be researchers your whole career. But one would hope that you are a better director of the Mekong Institute from having been a researcher at some point. You are a better director general you are a better minister, you are a better uh, private sector operator. To me, the, the, the actual discipline of being a researcher for at least part of your career, that's the opportunity to be really, as Madam said, what's your idea? What's your focus? So a couple of questions. Um, what are you trying to understand or change? Who is your audience? Is your topic safe to work on? No one mentioned it, but that survey of policy influencing organizations, 36% said they're a little bit worried about retribution 
from their, their research. Okay, so again, that's part of being safe, thinking through what's your context. Okay, what have I not heard at all? Um, what I haven't heard is what are the really important issues that you want to work on? I, mean, I only got here sort of this morning, but um, uh, you know, global heating, more floods and droughts, um, the energy transition. You know, what are you really wanting to work on? That that stuff didn't come through, and it didn't come through on the boards. It was more principles. Yep, got to build trust. You know, got to this, got to that, got to the other. But I, I think I'm just reminding us that you know, there's really huge issues that not just Mekong researchers are working on. Researchers within government departments, researchers in the private sector, researchers in, in universities, you know, people are trying to figure this out. How to get the grid working when you sort of bring in all this solar and bring in all this wind. You know, there's, there's, there's countless things, but I just didn't get a sense of um, your motivations. Okay? So it's just... And I think motivation is pretty critical. So the boards are not particularly um, specific, but that's okay. Boropat was more specific. Um, what are the policies and practices that you are really trying to influence? Of course, that's got to be in our mind. Let's just quickly run through the day. Chayanas, right? I mean, for me, what was her, her real message was, you know, put your heart into it. If you're going to do this sort of work, you know, find, find what motivates you and then really get stuck into it. And she's a great example of someone who has found a, uh, a career that has motivated her and kept her motivated on every day that I've ever seen her. Pitchamon gave us a lot more clues about the policy process. Um, you remember that sort of uh, uh, two diagrams? We were going to sort of put them up, but we don't have time for that now. But there's a couple of diagrams there that I think are really useful um, Netra sort of identified some of her work on one of those diagrams. We are trying at CDRI to influence the agenda. We're not just trying to sort of, oh, what should we do next? Or what is the government asking for? What, what, um, what are the things we want to influence now that we as citizens, I can't see where she is. Oh, there she is. <laughs> but, you know, but Netra and her team, what do we think would be useful for our country, for our government, for this at this moment in time, um, and, and uh, Dr. Surya was also very, very clear on that. With I think some really good messages there at the end about okay, what do we really need to work on? Um, really quickly moving forward, um, Sen I think was great, great messaging for us as well about okay, let's we can all be. We're not all going to be as good at communication as she is, but we can be our best. You know, we can try and be our best in our own way. And it, it might be subtler, it might be quieter, it might be uh, more measured, uh, whatever. We might be writers, we might be speakers, but the communication is really critical. You may not represent your team in presenting the research, but you may coach the communicator, you know, in your team um, for them to do a better job. Jamie talked about mapping the dynamics. Um, for, for us, you know, we are... Uh, sorry, my name's John, John Dorr. I work at the Australian Embassy, and I work across Asia supporting our embassies. Okay, if we're going to invest in a certain area, if we're, we're, we have a request made of us, let's say by the government of Pakistan, you know, all right, we do a political economy analysis of how we might invest in this invest in time or effort. Maybe we should just stay right out. You know, but their choices and decisions, we have to sort of um, uh, make and take, and you can't just do that on a whim. You need some evidence. You need to talk to good people, and you need to be clear before you act. Now, that goes for me, and it goes for everyone else here, I would say. Righto. Um, two things I want to leave, leave you with. One is, um, we touched upon the transboundary just at the end there. Let's go to Lao and let's think about that monsoon project at the moment. So, blades from China, money from Thailand and Japan, uh, electricity to Vietnam, built in Lao, the lawyers are in Singapore, 
this is a multi-country transboundary project. Now, every one of those steps, there's been feasibility work. You know, the researchers have had to decide, can we build it? Yes, we can technically build it. Okay. The investors, can we make any money out of it? Is it safe? There's, there's sort of, there's a need for evidence-based research all the way in a good project. In a bad project, it may not get the attention it deserves. But I think picking those things, and, you know, I, I mention that because it's a, a water, energy, climate, Mekong transboundary project, and there's going to be lots more. The question is, are they going to be good projects or are they going to be ones that, that don't quite serve everyone's needs? Everybody's needs. And then the last example, um, <clears throat> and I'll just ignore Albert for a second, is uh, Tanapon and Chayanis and I were just in Beijing. And our, uh, we reconnected with a good friend of mine called Ma Jun from the uh, Institute for uh, Public and Environmental Affairs. So in 18 years, what have they done? He had an idea. I want to reduce water pollution. Where? All over China. How am I going to do it? Not sure yet, but I've still got the idea and I can then get, get working on it. Why? Because it's good for us all. So 18 years on, I think that organisation has made a huge difference because they worked out their method they worked out the, 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 the secret ingredient was, wow, the government of China keeps great records, but the data is not necessarily used. So they unlocked the data, but in a very uh, constructive engagement way. You know, this is good for the country. This is good for us all. And they kept going and they kept going and they used transparency, you know, accountability. And now companies want to get off the list, you know, because, you know, it's... They use technology to visualise things. Next job, does he retire? No. Second question, I want to reduce air pollution. Similar method, adapted it a bit, but you know, they're underway. Third issue, can we join the other good people that are already trying to reduce plastic pollution? But in terms of a research organisation, a public policy organisation, a policy influencing organisation, a changing practice, and changing the direction of one of the biggest countries on earth, it's, it's a great example. And I've already invited him to Bangkok, and next time he comes down, we'll invite everyone, and you can hear the story from him rather than the one-minute version from me. But it's, it's a good one to keep in mind that sometime, if we get our method right and we get our politics right, we can actually make a change. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, John. So just a few responses to, to your the challenges that you have mentioned. So about the tactical policymaking that Ajahn um, Pichamon had presented, we're going actually to follow through that with an, uh, a workshop in Vietnam happening late November to discuss about policymaking. So I'm just giving advance notice to Ajahn Pichamon if you can send me your materials and we can design the workshop along those lines. Second is that what to work on and what are you trying to influence? Somehow I will get Agus and Kunchayanit later to respond to this because that's um, what they're going to do. So there were a number of challenges that we have discussed since this morning and what we're trying to do is offer also a way forward. So this is not just going to be as what Andrew had just said earlier, a talk shop, but also an opportunity for us to plan things moving forward. So expect that. But what happens is that we're a bit pressed for time. But the good thing is that because we are late, that means you're close to your dinner, which is going to happen next door. So rather than for you to wait for an hour, you will just be waiting for like 15 or 30 minutes because we're a bit pushing the program forward. So with that, may I I'm sure you've already been aware that all the discussion have been visually synthesized by our uh, artists from Tofu uh, Creatives. Um, yes, Desiree is here to discuss what she has done in terms of summarizing our discussions. Okay. Uh, hey. Hi. Hello, hello. Okay, hi. So I'm Desiree from Tofu Creatives. Uh, 
It was an honor for us listening to all of you. And at the heart of what we do is deep listening. So it's been a joy for us to listen to all your insights and capture them. So just to start with communication strategies, uh, some of the insights were know your audience, understand your platform, understand policy interests, uh, trust building, and this was mentioned across all groups and throughout all of the discussions today. Having issues defined and owned by communities, using actionable language and solutions, uh, disability inclusion, having the translation of local languages, simplifying the language, art and storytelling, identifying local champions for continuity, and capturing local knowledge, and having context-specific tailored solutions. And over to key practices, um, it's important to build strong evidence, have community learning, engage in active listening, use audience-specific language, integrate JETC throughout the project, have capacity needs assessment and capacity building on this, engaging communities from the start and alignment with stakeholders, decolonize JETC, and building networks through personal and organizational relationships. And over to the last section on actions and approaches, community sharing of stories, peer learning exchange, showing the co-benefits to policymakers and to stakeholders, overcoming gender norms, cooperation of knowledge. It's also important to be realistic, expanding resources through networking, having an inclusive participatory approach, coordinated actions to support policymaking, ensuring that recommendations are actionable and operationalizing policy. So that's the big picture of today's session. And this is a work in progress. And as you know, it's a same day edit live illustration. And in the spirit of co-creation, we also want to ask the audience if you think there is something that's missing. And we want you to feel the ownership of this visual as well as it really did come from you and we're just mirroring it back. Thank you very much, Desiree. <laughs> Do you have comments on, on, on the visuals? Do you have comments about the way groups of people are being represented? Or, yes. Actually, I have one comment. I would like to learn how to do this one. <laughs> and the second thing I do think is we should put the word, yes, this, uh, I, I forget to tell, yesterday I already shared that. If we want to go fast, we go alone. If we want to go very far, we go together. Please add this uh, sentence to this. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go farther, Let's do it, go together. Very nice, thank you. So Desiree is going to take that into consideration. Any other issues? Do you think, are you happy to consider that summary as our summary? Dr. Juan is not happy. So can you have a micro microphone to Dr. Juan? <laughs> thank you. Uh, I just uh, see that uh, the more challenge we have uh, during the discussion and uh, case study, is how we understand the community and the decision-making process and decision-maker. But then the, the most challenge is that uh, many mention that we interact with them, we engage with them, uh, but we have a limited time to engage and interact with them. But my experience is that I engage with my wife over 50 years, but I still don't understand her. <laughs> So how with the short time we engage with community and policy maker, we can understand them and understand the decision maker is a Maguire maker. So thank you. Thank you. So clearly time is an important consideration, right? We cannot change things overnight, but hopefully what we're doing right now is a step in the right direction, right? And just to proceed further on that step. Again, as I mentioned in November, we're going to have a co-creation workshop, a workshop also on 
how do we enter, uh, influence the policy process? And we will start with Vietnam. So we are now designing, because if you notice, there's more participants also coming from Vietnam. So we're going to bring together our Vietnamese stakeholders and start our, our training, our capacity building on how do we really enable co-creation with communities? How do we do policy influencing? So expect some news from MTT about what's going to happen next in Vietnam. But there will also be a number of actions that will happen from now on moving forward for the, for the remainder of uh, MTT. In fact, for that, I would like to invite Agus, who is the program manager of MTT, to tell us exactly what's going to happen next so that all our discussions today won't just be discussions, but these are actually inputs to what we plan to take forward. Agus, over to you. Thank you, Albert. Uh, so, uh, time is very important. So, <laughs> I think I don't want to stand as the last person before the closing session uh, to hold you from your, you know, uh, relaxing uh, conversation and dinner. So, I just want to uh, flash the presentation, please. Yeah, okay. So, I just have a couple of slides, a few slides, uh, seven slides, actually. So, uh, I would like to share, responding to our discussion earlier, so what our MTT program uh, will do uh, in the future, but actually I want to also share what we have done, actually, because this is our core business. Our core business is to, is to enable, to empower the agents of change. Okay. So I just want to share the mission of uh, MTD program. The mission of MTD program is to kind of a, a different with Summonet. Uh, Summonet is closer towards research, knowledge co-production. But our program, MTD program, is closer towards engagement, policy influence. And our, if you notice there, there is a word that I would like to highlight, research and policy interface. And this, is, uh, this has been our mission, is that we, uh, we are trying to make possible for the research and policy interface to be strengthened. This is our mission in the program, in, in a nutshell. So what we have been doing is to kind of identify target groups that we would like, would like to work uh, with uh, in the program duration. There, there are uh, knowledge uh, based influencing organization, KBPIOs, as well as the next generation of uh, uh, researchers, policy makers, and also policy influencers. So this is how we see uh, the two uh, agents of change that will kind of change the landscape of policy, research and policy in the Mekong. Um, so from, from our discussion today, uh, I would like to kind of uh, give a, a, a highlight on four key points on building relationship, managing boundaries, communicating for impacts, and advancing inclusiveness. Okay. So we have done something, actually. We have done uh, some intervention uh, in these four aspects. For example, for building relationship, we have been establishing and nurturing what we call MTT Alliance. We, yesterday we have a meeting uh, with Alliance members. We've been also encouraging co-production of knowledge uh, among the uh, knowledge-based uh, policy influencing organization. We also uh, optimizing linkage with uh, Summonet. In managing boundaries, we've been uh, supporting uh, financially, uh, but also uh, capacity, in, in terms of capacity of the KBPIOs. Engagement with the uh, policymakers in the inception of the project, as also mentioned by several uh, previous resource person and speakers. Capacity building on policy engagement, this is what we are doing. In terms of communicating for impact, we, uh, you know, have, uh, we have uh, had uh, many trainings on how to effectively communicate 
information findings from the research, how to formulate, uh, let's say, the message in the blog or in other uh, means of communication. We also uh, provide uh, communication channels for those uh, KBPIOs through our uh, MTT program and also through Summonet. So in terms of advancing uh, inclusiveness, we've been also, like Karen mentioned earlier, we've developed the uh, MTT JETSI strategy, but also more specifically, we are providing also guidance note for the uh, KBPIOs, for the grantee that we are supporting. We also, Karen mentioned about linking JETSI focal points in those projects. Uh, we've, done, we've done capacity building for the JETSI on the JETSI knowledge cooperation and policy engagement. And also, uh, we also provide uh, knowledge exchange among those uh, JETSI experts and also focal points. So, like what Albert mentioned, what, what we intend to do more, at least in the next couple of months and also early in the year, uh, we plan to have a national policy workshop. This is the first one will be in the Mekong Delta. Uh, we recognize that there are many challenges in the Mekong Delta in terms of climate uh, change impact. So I think it's uh, also timely uh, to have this uh, national policy workshop to discuss about uh, climate resilience in the context of Vietnam, but specifically also Mekong Delta. So as Albert mentioned, we've we, we are using uh, Achan Pichamon kind of approach in terms of uh, policy research and how to approach policy engagement. So uh, I hope there is no pattern or uh, introduction rights for this, uh, but uh, we will ask Achan Pichamon's permission to use this kind of approach in our next uh, workshop. Uh, we will also support in-country engagement in terms of uh, connecting with maybe with the uh, advisor, with our program secretariat to support more activity on the ground. We also will expand the Alliance membership and also facilitating cross-learning more knowledge exchanges among the Alliance members. Uh, we will also plan for, uh, there is a uh, a nice uh, mention about uh, how to uh, advance uh, disability inclusion. So we will have also workshop on disability inclusion in the future. Um, first, also back to back in Vietnam, but also uh, followed by hybrid sessions and more sessions. And we will also support the learning platform for the MTT fellows to exchange among themselves. Uh, actually, this is a bottom-up request from them. So uh, they would like to have opportunity to share more about their experience. Of course, annual policy forum like this, we will have also continuing uh, next year. And also what's important is, and maybe for a long term, that we will try to have a joint program between uh, Summonet and MTT. Uh, to be you know, proposed to our kind donors, DFAT and SIDA. So that's more like medium to long term. Next. That's it for me. Uh. Thank, you. Th thank you very much, Agus. So I hope you can see that there are things that we're going to do together moving forward so that we can go farther. Um, there are a number of plans, a number of activities that we will be uh, rolling out in the next few months. Can I ask everyone again um, to join us in, the, in another poll? But before that, can I just ask Kunklumjit or Boripat if there are questions online? Are there, um, or in Hoover? If there's none, Agus, can we? Get your uh, smartphones again, if, if you can just go to bbooks.app 
And then the ID is 1594189300, or you can scan the QR code. And the question is written on top. What sh I think it's the question is, what's your takeaway from this policy forum? So please share what with everyone. Okay, can we start showing Agus? What do we have there? Okay, first thing we need to decolonize Gedsi gender. Okay, it's been moving too fast. I couldn't follow. <laughs> Let's see. Okay, we'll see first what comes out. You can also vote which among of those ideas you would like. If you agree to, to any of them, you can also vote for them so that they come up on top. Okay, maybe I shouldn't synthesize because there's quite a lot of them, but several mentions about GEDSI gender policies, gender inclusivity. Tactical is mentioned also a number of times, uh, building trust, how to publicize your research findings, better understanding of MTT. Interesting, so, this are, so it seems that we have gained a number of things from this policy forum, so that's good. So a big round of applause to everyone for, for a very productive day. Can we go to the next question, Agus? There are only two questions, don't worry, I want to hold you long, but the, the next question is, so, what commitments or actions do you have following this forum? Is there anything that you want to take forward, like maybe an email to a partner or a, a meeting or a joint proposal? What is it that you want to take forward because of this policy forum? Or maybe just a question to somebody. Okay, shall we show Agus? Okay, so there's a number of things already that you wanted to, uh, uh, okay, proposal is one of them. Incorporating GEDC, engaging with uh, uh, boundary partners. There will be activities in, in Laos. We need to integrate GEDC in, in, in green or climate finance. Some of you would like to do more advocacy, right? Okay, so it seems there's a number of action points that, that you plan to take forward. That, that, that's good. So now, um, Agus mentioned that um, we're, we plan to do this policy forum regularly. So this is already the second policy forum. So what I'd like you to do in maybe in... We don't have a lot of time, but if you can do it in the next five minutes, is if you can help us uh, evaluate the forum. So Agus will, the same link, if you go to the uh, tab, the survey tab of BVOX, it's on the right of your app. Can I have uh, a look at your app? It's on this on the leftmost side, there's a survey button there. And if you can just fill in the survey and tell us what you feel, how you feel about the forum so that we can improve this further and make sure that this forum will respond to your uh, concerns, to your needs uh, in the future. So that tab is on the left. 
and there are several, a few questions. There's not a lot. I think you can do this in, in, in two to three minutes. And I can promise you we're going to close at 5.30. But before we do that, um, let's give ourselves two more minutes to complete the survey. And then I would like to invite Dr. Chayane to reflect on the outcomes of the policy forum and offer her uh, the vision, offer the vision of the MTT moving forward. But just before Pika, we still have one more minute. For, for for them to, to finish the survey. Okay, so while you're trying to wrap up the survey, may I now invite Kunchayanit to offer some words of gratitude and also the vision moving forward at the same time to close uh, MTT Policy Forum 2024. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Albert. Um, I'm so happy that we have so many friends, not only friends faces that I'm familiar with. Today, I actually met many new colleagues and now become really new family members. I feel the MTT Alliance you know, program and Summonet is expanding day by day. And today, in the morning, I already mentioned about my dream and also my hope. What is this MTT forum? policy forum would achieve. That's four things. One is we really hope to have this full day as opportunity for us to interact as regional forum and platform that we really say out. And I would like to make special thanks, not only us here that we see in person, but we actually have about 50 participants online that stay with us until the end. And you could see this is really a strong commitment to have someone sit in front of kind of screen for full days to listen and also interact actively among themselves to discuss and how they can join us as a communities. I feel so much grateful and also see that this is why we stick together because even we cannot be closer in practice, in person. But our intentions, passions there, and you could see not by words, but also see by your eyes, and again, I would say by our heart, what our people and what our team and everyone here is doing. So we have really achieved the first objectives. The second objective is about evidence. And I would say I was really fascinated with many examples that speakers talk about this. And it doesn't need to be really big, a great impact. But it is real and truly reflecting the situation on ground that I will never know, I will never have experience, I will never be able to tell the stories without having this you to talk about it. And give us the idea on how we can prioritize our effort in coming years to make sure that this story is not stopped here. Your stories will have multiplier impacts. Not only that you go back and work continually in your communities and your place, but you will have now friends, group in the family's members here 
to join the effort to make the stories in the communities, in the province or in the district, is the stories of the Mekong that everyone should know and learn from. I think this is really great. And the third one, we talk about capacity building. Not only the young or the fellow, and actually I will say, I confess that I learned from them. I see our media fellows, alumni, talking about their work, and ask us, we should be, how to say, learn how to do listening more. How we can reflect, and how can we actually really understand people that we work together. And that's really the beauty. Not only the young people that need to learn, we, I think I'm still very young in my heart. I'm learning every day, you know. <laughs> so, and I really like to borrow one of the kind of wordings that um, my dear friend, uh, Dr. Hapna Wee, she's a former chair. She told me, she said that, you know, she really believed that the young people have so much energy. They can do a lot of things. And their more senior people know the way how to do it, you know. How we can make sure that either they are young or either they are senior have a lot of expertise and many years work together and make, maximize what we have as a resources, common pool of resources to make this world more livable, you know? She's smiling and she's my, one of my idols. She always behind the scene. She doesn't want to say things in front of the state. But we need this group of people that want to be supporters and for agents of change to have the opportunity. And I really feel that today we try to really help that. But I also receive a lot of constructive feedback that we should talk more about core work, core sector on water security, where's the climate change impact, where's the energy security transitions. This is something we keep in mind and we actually discuss a lot. And I would like to say that the reason why we design this policy forum in this forum, we don't talk about technical things, it's because of the reflection. We are the network organization of learning. The recent midterm evaluations tell us that we are doing great on many things. We have established the platform, growing, vibrant. We're doing this a lot. We already start this really good initiative. We already see a lot of impact, but what are the key things that we still need to do more? It's really to admit ourselves that we have some weakness. We need some area to learn. It's how we do inference, engage, do knowledge co-production, and real engagement. Many of our report program design looks excellent. But in reality, when we face, we talk in depth, it seems that we actually probably not do enough our jobs to make sure that we really help not only providing the grants and do training, but really have open discussion. And many of us here feel maybe excited at the beginning and feel energy die down. But I would say we have to repeat ourselves that engagement need energy. Engagement need patience. Engagement need long term. And we have to be persistent, you know? And when we go back, we will quickly do our final report and submit and then oh, really relax. And then next time when we need to meet, oh, again, okay, I have to contact this person. This is typical way of what we're doing. That's why we organize this policy forum in the way to talk about this, how to enhance the influence, effectiveness of knowledge-based policy inference organization. Because we have this independent reflection, and because we have this witness, and because we accept that we are learning about this, 
and we will continue to learn about this. This is all are the processes. And what is, I was asked what is my vision. You know, I will come back to very simple. This is my hope as a mother. My vision is to have this Mekong. It's a place, very nice place for my son, for his kids, and for his friends, you know. He will have very safe water, you know, really nice kind of electricity and others, but without really make other people suffer because of this excess. And he can actually enjoy, and also we are have capacities to address any uncertainty linking with the climate and others uncertainties. And we believe that by having these communities of organization of individual who bring the fact to propose to those who have everyday decisions to make the decision based on best available knowledge, belief, good intention. And whatever the future is, it may not look like what we have done, but then I would tell myself that I have no regret because today I already doing best. And this is the best world this mother can create for you. And I hope that everyone have your own vision. I hope that this forum contribute anything or any attempt you are doing to achieve your own missions and visions. Thank you very much, everyone, and please enjoy your day. Thank you very much, Pika. A big round of applause. And also a big round of applause to all of you for excellent participation. And as a reward, there's going to be dinner here. But for now, you would have to quickly step out so that we're, we will be able to set up this place for dinner. So again, thank you very much for your wonderful participation. And let's come back again at 6 o'clock sharp for the dinner. All right?